Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today's edition of Ask an Airstreamer is with Carava owner Marissa. Before introducing Marissa, I want to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Chris, and in addition to being an Airstream owner myself, I get to work with the Airstream community, helping to share their stories of adventure, curiosity, and exploration in their Airstream. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and will be published on airstream.com next week alongside other editions of Ask an Airstreamer. In other words, don't worry about writing everything down. You'll receive an email to this video later next week. To submit your questions at any point today, go ahead and click the Q&A button at the bottom of this screen. We'll do our best to answer all of them, but if we run out of time, we'll share an email address at the end to submit your questions. After Q&A, we'll share a promo code for Airstream Supply Company, which is part magazine, part travel guide, and part outfitter. And lastly, there's a two question survey that will be emailed right after we wrap up today. We'd like your feedback so we can learn what you liked and things that we could do better in future editions. So let's take a quick look at what we're going to cover. First, we'll spend about two minutes learning about how the Caravel came to be. We'll get to know Marissa. We'll understand from her firsthand why she chose a Caravel and some of her favorite features. She'll share a bit about her unique approach to full-timing in an Airstream. And we'll have Q&A all throughout, but also a dedicated section at the end. And we're also going to share something a little bit, uh, hopefully fun and different today. We'll have a series of polls that will drop uh, into the webinar to ask this or that. So you just pick your preference, a uh, series of five questions, and they'll review the answers at the end and then get Marissa's point of view on what she prefers. So before we turn it over to Marissa, I thought we'd uh, just take a quick moment to, to talk about the history of the Caravel <clears throat> and how it came to be. So Caravel was originally introduced in 1956, and then it was reintroduced in its current form in 2020, and it went kind of in and out of uh, being in existence in Airstream's product lineup in the 70s and 80s. But now, uh, as we know today, uh, was reintroduced in, in 2020. And it was really named after Airstream founder Wally Byam's love of seagoing vessels. This new iteration maintains the feel of a landborne yacht. Uh, an interesting fact, uh, because of Wally's love for the sea, you see a lot of nautical names in the Airstream product lineup, including Caravel, Clipper, Trade Wind, Flying Cloud, Liner, and Land Yacht. In addition, many of the interior components in Airstreams today were named or referred to by nautical names, including galleys and bulkheads. So interesting, just fun history lesson, fun fact. Uh, we'll turn it over to Marissa now so she can share her story. Marissa, first, I wanna thank you for your service. I wanna thank you for uh, taking the time to, to join us and sharing your experience with the Airstream community. And welcome to Ask an Airstreamer. Tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you, Chris and the Airstream team for inviting me to speak on a topic that brings so much life to me and that's Airstreaming. Uh, so a little background on myself. So I'm 29 years old, living full time in my 2020 Airstream Caravel. And I would consider myself as someone who's pursuing a nomadic lifestyle, but with a twist as I've been serving the past five and a half years uh, on active duty as a US Army Captain in the Medical Service Corps. Uh, so the mindset I've held for many years is that one day I will, when I retire, I want that dream uh, <laughs> that I could just go live life and explore and live in an RV. But as you'll learn here today, um, that dream does not have to be so far in the distance and you don't, do not need to have a remote job to live the lifestyle that sparks so much curiosity and adventure. Uh, so a little background on me growing up is that I was pretty terrified of camping uh, because I was afraid of the dark, especially in the woods and with bugs. And it wasn't until I approached my early to mid twenties uh, that I became an avid camper and uh, became a backpacker um, through all regions of the US. Uh, so with those learned experiences, camping became so in integrated in my life that I find myself becoming this epitome of what you can call a weekend warrior traveler uh, by escaping on weekends to a nearby forest to recalibrate after a what felt like a disconnected work week. Uh, so with this warrior weekend routine, I came to a turning point in my life uh, where I questioned my personal life aspirations. Uh, I felt like they were accelerating um, not as at the same speed as my professional aspirations were. 
Uh, so after eight years of college and a few years spent in the military, I started thinking, was I just another player in the game of life chasing the never satisfying rat race? Um, and I did not want to sacrifice how I spent my free time solely based off a job that already consumes over 50 hours or more a week. Um, and I'm, I, at the same time, I'm I was not ready and still not ready to separate from military service uh, as my work does bring me so much purpose in keeping our nation's heroes healthy and cared for. Um, so with those that thought in mind, uh, my wheels started spinning in my head and I was figuring out how I can integrate my many years away retirement dream, uh, living in nature uh, while working a location based job. Um, so if the military taught me anything thus far, uh, it's resilience and creating solutions to any obstacle. Uh, and a quote my uncle had shared with me in the past was, if the why is big enough, the how to is easy. Uh, so within two weeks, I terminated my apartment lease, bought a truck and drove to the closest Airstream dealer uh, to purchase my first Airstream and just told myself I'd learn as I go. And I did just that. Uh, so fast forward to present day. Um, my life has uh, been changed in ways that words just cannot fully describe. Um, this lifestyle provides me that simplicity of living with only my necessities and a newfound freedom that I never knew existed uh, while stay staying uncomfortable and continuously learning. So really overall, all I get to come home after work each day and truly detach and um, basically as I would if I was retired and it's really getting to the root of what it means to be alive and connect to this earth in a modern way. It's awesome. It's it's the best of both worlds, having that nomadic lifestyle early on, being connected to the nature. So I love how you blended uh, so many themes in terms of your approach. And you're 8,000 miles in. So tell us a little I, bit about uh, what the experience has been so far. <laughs> well, as you can see from the overview map outlined there, um, I've traveled and camped all around the East Coast and making visits to any national park or national forest along the way. And some of my best camp spots um, on my journey so far has been the beaches of Florida, the White Mountains in New Hampshire, um, and the mountains of North Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, with my most, I would say, sacred camping experience being in upstate New York uh, in the Adirondack Mountains, uh, which is the largest, the largest single protected region uh, found in the lower 48 states, and it encompasses over 6 million areas of mountainous land. Um, so where I am right now uh, in the trees is I've chosen to do a monthly rent process where I go to um, a campground um, just in the area, um, but for a month at a time. Um, I enjoy this approach because it really allows me to learn the geographical area that I would typically not know anything about, or, and at the same time get to know the native land and meet a more variation of campers. Um, and the campgrounds I've currently been staying at have been within 45 minutes or less to work. Um, including the St. Lawrence River, uh, which separates the border of the United States and Canada, um, islands and coves off the Great Lakes, uh, well, Great Lakes, Great Lake uh, Ontario, and private spots just nestled in various forests like I am um, parked right now. And I'll occasionally live on base at the campground to have a two minute commute to work, uh, to have an affordable, really quick uh, drive to work uh, routine. So that's pretty much where I am, right, am at right now. I, I love the idea of, you know, thinking, where do I want to park my cabin in the woods for the next month and, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. having that, that, that freedom and flexibility to do that. I want to pop in and just and address a couple of questions that have come in on the chat. Just confirming yeah. you have a 20 foot care bell. Is that right? Uh, a 2020 or a 22 foot. Okay. 2020, 22 foot. Yeah. yeah, just, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <100 foot> <laughs> and, and then, uh, Remind us again that the tow vehicle you're using, and then I might have a follow-up question based on that. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so and I know we get uh, into this later, but uh, just yeah, a we will. Right we now. will, but yeah, yeah I, I can. Uh, so I have a 2021 uh, Ram 1500 Bighorn. Um, it's the built to serve edition. I got that just because I had an American flag on it, and I was like, yes, I want an American flag. <laughs> so and it comes with the tow package, so that's why I went that route. Perfect. My experience has been when when air streaming that you know magical things happen. It's this catalyst to connect with friends and family, and and you you have so many meaningful experiences when you're when you're out doing that. But 
What, what does the air streaming mean to you? And there's some pictures on the slide I'd love for you to walk us through. Yeah, so to answer this question, I do wanna begin by addressing an observance I've learned through living this lifestyle. And I feel like most first world countries like the United States has become numb to our daily spaces such as our homes and workplaces because of the routine that surrounds them. Um, and I found that this causes us to lose this sort of energetic awareness of our space and especially the objects within that space. Uh, so with Airstream living, it really requires conscious and continuous awareness and really purposeful intention to the places or to the things you place inside. And it also requires continuous observation of the surrounding area because you're always moving and parking in a new location. And so for me, these acts provide a really sacred way of self-expression and freedom. But also this lifestyle means connecting with friends and family uh, by celebrating Mother Earth together and meeting uh, the people that come along with me at their comfort level uh, because Airstream really accommodates all types of personalities uh, with the convenience of home. And so like my parents and myself are in one photo there, we're in Lake George, uh, and then I'm at, on Lake Ontario for another one, Georgia for another, and Florida. So and a couple of really good friends as well are in those photos. And it's funny, so when, so a friend comes with me and then let's say they tend to listen in on a conversation I have um, with another friend and I'm inviting them to come on a trip with me that other friend will always chime in and say well it's it's not that type of trailer camping you think like she has an airstream it's luxury camping and it's kind of funny but it's it's really nice <laughs> and people are usually pretty surprised by how nice they are yeah I, I would never get my parents to go camping <laughs> Once I said, let's go in the airstream, I'm like, sure, Grand Canyon, that sounds wonderful and great. Uh, you, you have uh, some experience and perspective because a lot of the, the, that's unique because a lot of the travel that you're doing is solo. Yes. So talk us, you know, one of the big pieces, obviously, about towing an airstream or the airstream experience is towing. Walk yeah. us through some kind of unique tips and perspectives that you have from doing this on your own. Yeah, and as you can see there, I walk that fast as that video shows. Quick, getting stuff done. <laughs> I wish, I wish. <laughs> um, I would say, well, my first tip would be uh, when it comes to picking a tow vehicle um, and you have the opportunity uh, to either upgrade your backup camera or just get a nice backup camera to start with, I would really recommend that when you're solo towing. Um, I first owned a blurry backup camera. It's a different truck that's in the photo in the video versus the newer truck I bought, which is on the top left screen. Um, and having a clear visible backup camera uh, really um, basically takes away the guess and check um, by backing up in slow increments and jumping on my truck a handful of times to see where um, I am in relation to the hitch. Um, and so, as you can see in that top middle photo, um, I'm very, very just proud of myself for mastering the craft of hitching um, and getting my getting that completely lined. Uh, that that was one of my life's greatest achievements. Um, is that photo right there? It was it was first try perfect, and I just can't believe that happen so um <laughs> you get really excited about that those kind of things when you're solo towing um my i would say another tip i'd like to share is if you are solo towing and it's your first time i would reserve with the campground um with and talk to management about trying to reserve multiple available parking spots if you can so you can routinely switch campsites uh, to practice hitching in your unhitching skills um, especially because at different camp spots um, you know, you're either backing in or pulling through and uh, it really offers that unique experience each time because every camp spot is leveled differently as well. Um, and I found that it took me practicing five times on different occasions to feel really comfortable with the craft of towing um, and have solutions ready in my toolbox for when things didn't go up according to plan. And just in retrospect, I think it really eased the solo towing pressure um, and allowed me that necessary time to master the skill and problem solve without like having a traveling timeline constraint. Um, because with my spontaneous and eager personality, I think I would have rushed the learning process and could have ended up a little bit more underprepared. Uh, so that's that's definitely a takeaway I recommend for any new solo travelers. And um, I would say another another tip would be to really 
emphasize is, um, and I learned this the hard way, is to put your wheel chocks down before unhitching to prevent the trailer wheels moving um, when parked on uneven terrain. Um, because once um, once you unhitch, your trailer no longer is stabilized by the tow vehicle. And I did learn that the hard way um, by not having uh, the, the uh, chocks down. And so I never forget after that experience. And the last tip I do want to share is that it's really uh, important to be very patient um, and accept in the beginning that it's a very steep learning curve, um, but can be mastered very quickly. Um, and not forgetting that there are always continue to be challenges ahead, whether it's your first time towing or a hundredth. Uh, so that's, those are some tips I'd like to share with everyone today regarding solo towing. The, the, the patience reminds me of a, of a phrase that someone once said to me that slow is pro, right? There's, there's, there's no rush. And, and especially sometimes too, if you're backing into a campsite and you feel the pressure because there might be you know, people waiting to pass you and it's, yeah. they can wait, right? You, you do your thing and, and it's going to be okay. So, so there's yeah. that one. And then I've, I've also heard of um, people taking pictures or videos of what does it look like when it's hitched up correctly, right? In terms of the safety yeah. cable. So just as a great reference to maybe have on your phone, save it as a favorite so you can quickly find it just to have that visual reference. And then I also, by the way, you're not the only one who learned the lesson about the wheel chocks. There's some comments in the chat about people having the same experience. Yeah. Uh, I always do a walk around. I once may have driven away with a stabilizer jack down. Um, so that was, uh, well, that was fun, but. <laughs> We've all been there and that's what this is about is sharing, sharing knowledge and experience. So lots of, lots of great tips here in terms of towing solo. You also have some, some other uh, tips and insights that you can share when it comes to just traveling solo. Walk us through these. Yeah, because with, with, I mean, when I say solo towing, it could be really for just anyone you can be towing with other people. Um, it's just really important to have a routine that makes most sense to you and have a checkoff list hanging somewhere visible. So you, especially if you don't have a second brain to ensure you haven't easily forgotten any missteps. Um, so a few key things for me um, that can be really easy to forget and I want to highlight to everyone today is to ensure the shower door, bathroom mirror, refrigerator, cabinets, and windows are closed and latched. Just don't want those things uh, possibly moving um, uh, during, during the uh, little uh, earthquake that happens when you're on the road and to check check tire pressure before you get on the road and really invest in a portable tire pressure pump. I got one at Walmart and it, it's great. I don't have to worry about stopping at a gas station. I just do it before I leave um, and ensure that the awnings are locked and secure because it could get really easy to forget that if you're just kind of closing things and just going in for the night because uh, you're going to open it in the morning. Um, and then uh, one that I sometimes uh, forget just because it's higher up outside the airstream is to close the flaps uh, for the stove vent that is located like outside so it doesn't uh, freely flap while you're on the road. And always remember to lift the stabilizers up before hitching so you don't damage those foot plates. Um, so uh, those have just been some routine ones that I find could sometimes slip your mind. Very helpful. And it's a great segue to some questions that are in, in the chat. One was, uh, in terms of worrying about pests or critters getting into your airstream while you're, while you're away at work and, and not always there, have you had any issues with that? And if so, what did you do to remedy it? So I've, I had sometimes a couple ants, so I put like little ant traps in different corners of my trailer. Um, I mean, I, I don't have the... the Airstream is pretty good at sealing away bugs. I do see occasional spiders um, or just like little mm -hmm. flies that follow me or mosquitoes. Um, they usually just like attack the lights and I uh, just turn off the light and scoot them out. I try not to kill them, but I do sometimes. So <laughs> shame on me. <laughs> but um, um, it's kind of inevitable, inevitable when you are camping, but it's definitely a lot less. Um, and really all I've had to do is put up the little ant traps. I haven't had any like big issues at all. Um, and I hate spiders and terrified of them and really have only had a couple scares of daddy long legs. <laughs> all right, all right, good. Pa Pam and Sarah have similar questions uh, that I'll just wrap up into one. What okay. kind of weight distribution hitch, if any, are you using with your Caravel and tow vehicle? Yeah, I'm using the st uh, the uh, stabilizers. Oh, not stabilizers, sorry, uh, the, oh my goodness. What is it? The bars, I'm trying Equalizer. to name. Yeah, equalizer. Thank you. Equalizers. Okay. Yes. I'm 
I'm using equalizers. Thank you. Um, and I really recommend getting the um, like a just kind of lubricant for them because they could mm -hmm. get uh, tight. So I really recommend lubricating those, um, especially um, for I, I'm I. I'm in the army and I do have upper body strength, but sometimes not enough. <laughs> I finally get to struggle. So I, I loosen those up and now I have no issues. The, they also make great little plastic shims that you can put on the, on the, um, the A-frame, so on the Airstream side. Uh -huh. So you don't have metal on metal contact. I remember the first time I was driving and maneuvering and you hear these like pops and cracks. You're like, what is that? So they have these <laughs> little shims that you can also put on. So it, it provides a little bit of, uh, eases the friction so you don't hear some of that noise. <clears throat> Uh, let's see a couple other questions here. Richard says, Hey, your story is really inspiring. He's curious. How does this work in the military? Do you work on different bases from time to time? Or are you mainly centered around one base? Yeah. Um, so every three years, um, two to three years, I do move bases. Um, so it, I am there for a couple year mark. I mean, unless I deploy right at any time the nation could call and then I would put this in storage and, and do my mission. Um, but I am locally based um, at a, at a couple year rotation. And then, if, um, and then, you know, if things change though, then I just move and I have my house. <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah, it's some kind of unknown, um, but that's kind of what makes this easy. One more question here before we move on to a little bit about why you love the Caravel. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a basic toolkit. Can you give us a little bit of insight to what's in that toolkit? Yeah, yeah. My basic toolkit has all like, so I actually ordered a lot of things from Airstream Supply Company um, that just like uh, for um, the electric panel, for just like different like, like screws. Um, it's really, I, it's funny. I, the only thing I've ever had to repair is the towel rack on the um, the bathroom door. Uh, sometimes gets loose and will undo itself, so I have to just get a nail and screw back in. And um, I'm trying to think, I really haven't had to use it too much um, at all. Um, but I just have like the basic odd end things for if like backups, um, second, um, just second, um, more like cleaning stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I have, but I just have like backup of anything that I need. I'm like looking around, like what? Fuses, extra fuses, screwdriver, yes, maybe yeah, a socket. Yeah, set, like yep, just like little like odd ends, nothing, <clears throat> just usually little things um, that I need to do, little fixes, um, nothing super crazy so far. Perfect. So we're dropping some links to chats to just different yeah. kits from air, links in the chats to different kits in Airstream Supply Company. And then also we've done two other episodes of Ask an Airstreamer uh, focused on other people who are doing solo travel. So we'll also drop those into the chat for folks who wanna see more of that. So Absolutely. why the Caravel? And, and you, know, you walked up to the Airstream dealership, I'm sure did some research online, lots of options to choose, but yeah. why specifically the Caravel? Yeah, I mean, I will share, I showed up to buy the Bambi. <laughs> So um, and here I am. So I ended up ultimately purchasing my 2020 Caravel 22 FE uh, model for many reasons. And what stood out to me the most was really the bright white interior design that really opens up a small space um, to feel bigger than it actually is. Um, plus the open floor plan feels like a studio room with visibility of all windows at every corner, uh, wherever you sit inside. Um, and I just love sitting. I love the idea that I could sit on my bed uh, that lays right against the large wraparound window um, and allows me to feel closer to nature when I'm inside, uh, especially when waking up in the morning and on rainy days when I can't go outside. And also I really appreciated the exterior and interior upgrades uh, the Bambi from the Bambi model, um, such as so the three extendable awnings, the electric um, hitch jack, uh, the extra five feet width inside, creating more space between the kitchen and dinette, uh, the convection microwave that truly bakes like an oven, in my experience, and the uh, ductless, more quiet air conditioning system uh, without that large air conditioning uh, unit that usually sits on the ceiling inside. Um, and let's see, the three burner stove, it really looks uh, like one you would see in a kitchen. And I really like the solar panel edition. Uh, so I believe that this model is really the perfect size for one person to tow and live in full time, but still accommodating those guests and even a partner to join full time as well. 
Um, and I would like to chime in just to say that I named my Caravelle Moon and I chose to name her Moon, uh, not just because she's round, silver and shiny, uh, because I look at my Airstream with the same wonder and excitement um, as I look at the moon in the sky every night. So it's a constant reminder. I love that. So 8,000 miles in, you have the 22 and Joe wants to know, would you have done something smaller or maybe a little bit bigger? You have, you have the perspective now of experience. So if you could do it over again, would you do a 22? Yeah. Great question. Cause I asked myself the same question as I was buying it. Like, am I making the right choice? And I am 120% happy with this model. I've even thought about upgrade, not thought, thought about it, but during a time I was like, hmm, maybe I should. And I just can't, like, I, I can't get out of this. I, I think it's absolutely amazing. I think the only reason I would upgrade or when I, when I say when I do is if I am full-time with a partner and I choose to have kids, um, I think I would want a little bit more space um, for full-time. Uh, but in the immediate next, even five years, I'm, I'm here. This is it. I'm super happy with it. That's so great to hear. There's a lot of uh, research that shows when people do upgrade, it's always a little bit bigger. So the first one they buy, um, they un maybe underestimate the size that they want and they, they have their yeah. perspective and experience and like, oh, yeah. bigger would be great. So you got it right the first time. I was gonna, yeah, I know. I was going for a 16 foot Bambi and came out with the 22 uh, Caravel. So awesome. We have a, a slide that comes up. There are a couple of questions. What are some of the key distinctions between a Bambi and a Caravel? So we'll talk about that in a bit. A couple yeah. more questions in the chat. Susan wants to know any issues camping, not only solo, but as a solo female uh, out, out in the wild? <clears throat> yeah, and that's, you know, a concern that I going into it, I, it was in the back of my head. Um, and I've really found that being at campgrounds and choosing safe spaces, right, you don't want to, if I was choosing to be in various parking lots or just on certain land that wasn't essentially like reserved for a camp spot, it could be a little more, you never know who's going to be coming in and out of those areas where as at a campground, it's usually very safe space and people are um, have like minded um, supportive feelings and just really um, value um, this lifestyle and I really just want to learn about everyone and so I haven't had really any um, bad experiences. I've had people question like if I own it or if I'm renting or if it's my husband's or boyfriend's but um, usually they get really surprised that no one's with me and it's more a conversation of well wow I, I didn't realize that. Um, so it's more of assumption based than it is like feeling um, at harm or going like in a dangerous situation but I haven't I've it's only through the experience I've had so far who knows what the future could um, could say um, but with mine it's been great. Great great, great perspective. Tell us a little bit about some of the things that really drew you into the Caravel and parts that you love about it. Yeah, so as you can see this picture of inside my home, uh, the Caravel design really adds this homey touch. Uh, so um, if you look at these photos without context of what it is, I, I don't think you necessarily think you're in a camper, uh, maybe a spaceship. <laughs> But I, I do want to pay notice to the change I made where I took the dividers down um, between the dinette kitchen um, and the privacy curtain uh, between the bed space and, and the kitchen. Um, and I find it really opens up the space uh, to feel larger than it actually is. And uh, since there really isn't any privacy in a 22 foot home, I, I didn't really see the need for the separation between those spaces. Um, so if you have a caravel and, and have, have the board, uh, dividers up, I don't know, maybe this would change your mind or I haven't second guessed it actually threw away the dividers. <laughs> but, uh, so then another thing I really love is the dinette table uh, that's pictured here. It has 360 mobility. Uh, so it really makes daily life uh, really flexible uh, depending on what I'm doing. So I can turn the table to make more space for guests um, uh, who want more space when they're sitting down, or I can even roll the table out closer to my kitchen uh, for more counter space when I'm cooking. Um, and the din dinette even moves up and down so I can like put the table all the way down and um, turn the dinette into a couch or a bed uh, when I'm watching a movie or having a guest sleepover. Um, and then you can see my bed um, in this photo. It's hard to really tell the size. In most pictures, you really can't really gauge the size of a bed. Um, it actually ended up being larger than I expected. Um, and I use queen size sheets on it. Um, they do fit a little baggy, um, just but the extra material can easily be tucked uh, into the bottom of the bed. 
Um, so uh, that was a plus I noticed when, when getting the Caravel. And I do want to point out, because you can't really see since my curtains are open, but the curtains are blackout. So they really truly keep the space dark for mornings when I sleep in late from overnight duty or just daytime napping. Um, and then another thing that you kind of see uh, two speakers uh, in the back photo um, in the overhead and then there's speakers above on the ceiling of the Airstream. Uh, so you're really having that surround sound um, in inside your Airstream when you're playing music and you can turn it up and hear it outside when you're having a campfire and hosting people outdoors. Uh, so those those in this photo is really uh, key features I want to point out. And I think there are just a couple more on the next slide. Yeah, Marcus, yeah, should... yeah. So I do want to go through a few more as well. Uh, I feel like I can go on about features I love about the Caravel. <laughs> um, so if I could just point out a few more favorites. Um, the all electric fid fridge um, is what makes traveling with a refrigerator and frozen food uh, so easy um, because the solar panels keep the refrigerator running. So I don't have to worry about food getting spoiled, but definitely on longer uh, road trips. And um, while we're, while I mentioned the fridge, the, uh, the kitchen sink is really deep and extremely useful and appreciated to have. I, it's the size of a like a, like a full home kitchen sink. Um, people are pretty surprised about that when they come in. Uh, and then the storage is just plentiful. Like there are a lot of areas to store things. So I have four full size bins underneath my bed um, that the bed actually lifts up so you can access it. I have storage under the dinette. I have a deep size closet, um, which you could kind of see behind the TV in that second photo on the right. Um, and then I even have uh, what they use, I think Airstream advertises as a laundry storage um, behind the, uh, behind the me um, next to the bed, um, but I actually store all of my nightstand stuff. So like books, journals, and anything I'd put next to my bed. And then one biggest thing for me was actually uh, the all-in-one bathroom. So it's in the corner away from the main area. I personally like the little token of privacy the bathroom has for myself and for my guests to feel more comfortable. Um, there is even an elevated toilet seat that makes you feel like you're sitting on a throne. Uh, and there's a sitting shower space um, in the shower, which is really nice. And there's a lot of shelf room for hair products and shampoo and conditioner. Um, and then speaking of the shower, uh, the shower head feature uh, is um, awesome. So it gives you the option to turn off the water from the shower head um, while taking a quote unquote army shower uh, to save water, especially when you're boondocking and it keeps the water temperature the same. So when you go to turn it back on, instead of having to wait for the water to get back to the setting you had, um, you always have your personal preference every time. So those are the other things I really wanna point out on the Caravelle. I love the level of detail that you've gone. A lot of folks who have joined us today are either waiting for theirs to come or just, just took delivery of theirs or even considering one. So yeah. thanks for going uh, deep on some of those things that you really like. What's it been like full-time living and working in 22 feet of Airstream? Uh, so full time uh, living while working at a location based job is really the best of both worlds. Um, if you love your job, that is. Um, so I, I wake up and go to sleep so grateful because um, I've noticed it actually has enhanced my work performance because I no longer feel like my current job circumstance is setting me from living the lifestyle I would live if I was not working. Um, and so, uh, you know, the digital nomad life has always been intriguing to me, um, but I did learn during COVID that less social interactions at work. Um, I, I'm a very social creature and I crave in-person connections with my team. Uh, so since I don't think longevity, I, I could do a remote job um, that would develop on my strengths. Uh, this is the next best approach um, is to have that same lifestyle um, by having my home on wheels and just wherever my career takes me, my travels take me, I go. And uh, really this semi rooted approach also allows me to deeply learn, explore geographical areas um, for longer periods of time. Like I said, like I wouldn't necessarily come live in, um, like I'm finding this place in upstate New York is so precious and there's so much here that I would never think of. You don't see this stuff on blogs. Um, so I really get that. And then when I am feeling the go, go multi-day road trip travel bug, I just submit leave for a week or two at a time. And then I get to completely detach from work and truly embrace the experience in front of me. Um, so, so yeah, that's really how it works. And then sometimes if um, once, I think once COVID 
we're in a better place with COVID and we could do more traveling. Um, I will be assigned to different missions, uh, for example, in Albany, New York, um, or in Connecticut or um, Pennsylvania. I can take my trailer for those days, go do the mission, have my home, and then come back up here. And I don't have to worry about the military housing ac accommodations. Mm. I could stay in my house. Nice. I've, I've been in places before where I'm like, mm, I think I'd rather stay in my airstream. And, yeah, and yeah. not only is all your stuff there, but it's actually nicer than what you might yeah, experience. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know, sometimes the military, uh, and you know, they, they sometimes do a good job, but sometimes not so much. <laughs> so. <laughs> so when you do decide to hit the road and and explore a bit, not in your kind of home base, which are, which, where you are right now, mm -hmm. What are some of the tools and what's the approach that you use to finding a place to camp? Yeah, so I do have time to plan in advance since I pretty much know where I'll be living for two, three years at a time uh, for my military assignment. Uh, um, so when I'm looking at long-term area stays, I am pretty old school and go directly to Google Maps and I will assess the terrain from a bird's eye view, kind of like what's in that photo and find locations that catch my eye uh, in, proxim in proximity to areas I would choose to camp uh, if I was just passing through. And so once I find an area that looks intriguing to me, I pin them down, I Google search campsites in that area, and I just do this for multiple areas within um, either an hour radius of my duty station or if I'm just looking for a weekend trip and take, you know, five, six hour drive, do the same thing. Um, and then I just rank campsites with views is always my preference. Like I, I want the best views um, from my campsite. So the, that's my first priority, um, holding the most weight. And then I kind of select my choice from there. Um, and I also use hip camp. Um, it's like Airbnb if you've never heard of it, um, but for unique campsite stays uh, and um, you, you really get that community feel um, and you get to know the people and they really help you get to know the area as well. And I am a member of Harvest Hosts, um, which is an app giving you access to places like farms and wineries in the local area. Just uh, for when I say for free, it's for free, but you have to pay the annual fee. Um, but then you don't really have to think about the cost involved um, if you just pay that annual fee and then you just last minute want to go somewhere, go on Harvest Hosts and there you go. I love the the explorer type approach that you take with looking at the satellite view and kind of zooming in it reminds me of a an alternate version of spin the globe where you're like where do i want to go and you know where your finger lands yeah. so I, yeah. I, I i love the approach that you take it's always great to hear how how folks do this i've had yeah. really good luck especially camping in public land so blm national forest army corps there's always someone who's responsible for maintaining the roads in that district and I'll call, I'll figure out what district it is. I'll call that office and I'll say, hey, I have a, a, a 27 foot uh, camper and I'm looking for a place in your district where you know, either has a view or is near water. And those folks are incredibly helpful. And they'll say, oh yeah, if you go this way or this way, or you know, don't go this way because there's soft sand and you might get stuck. They're always so great. So just another resource for people who are looking to camp out in public lands and, and do some boondocking. Yeah. Speaking of you know interesting approaches, I love this slide when we were doing our, our walkthrough the other day in terms of your unique approach to storing things in yeah. transit. So tell us about this and 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 what we're yeah, what we're seeing here. Yeah, so a hack I came out up with and partly I'm just lazy um, sometimes is uh, the convenience of using a weighted blanket. Um, so what I do is to not have to put things in boxes and risk it clashing or scratching or breaking or just the act of having to move things to the truck. Um, I just lay it all out on my bed um, and then I place my weighted blanket over it, my, then my comforter and then pillows. And I'll even put like my yoga mat and blocks and other things on top of the bed that's not pictured here. But I place everything on there that's inside that needs to be uh, tucked away and held tight. And um, I find that when I go to park, it's right where it's supposed to be. But I do wanna mention um, that my bed is located in the front of the trailer. So there is less movement. Whereas if your bed is in the back of the trailer, I'm not really sure how the stability of those items would be on the bed. Um, someone maybe can try and let us know. Um, but I've had no issues with the thousands of miles I've driven uh, with this approach. So um, if you're looking for something convenient, especially if it's raining and not want to get things wet, just put it on the bed and cover it up with a weighted blanket. Brilliant. Bill says I'll hop into the chat here with some questions before we talk about your solar and battery setup. So. Bill just wanted to share in terms of other sites and resources to use for, for planning where to camp. 
thedirt.com is a great site. It's D Y R T.com. Yeah. David wants to know, did you ever winterize? And if not, have you had any tips for avoiding line freezing if you've been in cold climates? Yeah, antifreeze. So I do winterize my trailer. Um, and I, I, so <laughs> this is where I would like to learn um, since it was my first winter up here, I did go um, to an Airstream de dealer and had them do it because I didn't want to mess it up. It's my baby. Uh, it is essentially something I do want to learn, but I, I, I do want to say though, because um, you brought up with the winterization, just know that when you go to unwinterize it and you're trying to clear out all the antifreeze, know that the hot water might take time to come on and you really just need to run the system for a really long time. It, it took a couple days for me to have hot water again because some of the antifreeze got blocked up um, in the pipes. Um, so I almost had to, I almost brought it to the dealership and I'm glad I didn't take that time because it was just kind of clogged and just needed more time. And we can drop two links in the chat. We've done two Ask an Airstreamers on this topic with the uh, service leader back at Airstream. So there's one on winterizing. So as we get out of summer, how to do it, and then also yeah. how to de-winterize. So they're in the chat. We can also send them to you too. So you can, uh, you can, you can take a look. James wants to know what you're using for Wi-Fi connectivity and has it worked well? Yeah. So I, I use my personal hotspot on my phone and cause I, I do have really good service where I am. And actually that's how mm -hmm. I'm giving this talk today um, is through my hotspot. I have Verizon. Um, I have looked into and thought of doing the Airstream Wi-Fi. Um, I just haven't had time to bring it to um, get, get that installed. Um, but it's something I think about, but genuinely I, since I don't have a remote job, I try to stay away from uh, connectivity as much as I can when I'm come home, I'll like occasionally, you know, get on social media and stuff, but um, I, I, it's not something I, I need pretty much. I could just go to work All right. do that, but yeah. Greg wants to know, how do you manage surge protection and water filtration? Yeah, I, so I have a, the fil water filtration system um, hooked up to my, uh, my hose and I have a really, really big, everyone always comments on my, um, on my surge box. It's this um, dog on it and it has like code. I, I would have to get the name of it or like walk outside to grab it. Um, but it has a code when um, this, when like the electric goes out to tell me like what's wrong and mm. I have an app and it'll like fix it for me. It's it was. Me really cool um and i'm blanking on the name right now i'm sorry um but no I no no sorry what yeah uh, go ahead if, if you oh. can remember great if not we can we can look to follow up with it yeah of course <laughs> um i i do recommend investing in in a really good surge protector uh, because i do find that's like my most common um issue is sometimes um is a surge especially like in the south with a lot of like uh, storms they live in savannah mm -hmm. georgia um, and so I found that that has saved me a lot and not having to work, like worry about the electrical system at all. It, and just to add a little bit more detail on the water filtration, are you using the, the blue, I think it's made by Camco? Yes, yep. yep it, in line good. one connected to the hose between your, your city water and the, yes, the hose yep. itself? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. So far so good with that? Yeah, yeah, no problems, absolutely none. And then I use a hose that's um, insulated just in case it freezes at night. Perfect. Talk a little bit about your solar and battery setup. The Caraval comes with some standard features from the factory, which you've taken advantage of, but just talk a little bit about how that's worked for you so far. Yeah, so I so when it comes to boondocking, I'm very bare minimum uh, kind of way. So um, I'm, I'm not one of the, like, I, have, I don't have a generator, um, but I am upstate New York right now. So it's really easy to not really need a generator uh, for my boondocking trips. Uh, one, because they're short, just weekends. Uh, so I don't need AC on, uh, even summer months. I mean, I'm sitting in a uniform uh, in the middle of summer, almost fall, but it is not an issue. So really just for hot water, I use the propane option since I, you have that option between electric or uh, propane. And then I use the solar power for, um, for lights and charging station. And I do have... Um, like little to go um, battery packs um, for like my phone and stuff. And so really that's all I have needed. Um, and then I have propane to cook and everything and my refrigerators run off solar. So I really have no issues and I don't use a generator, uh, but I can imagine if I'm doing like a week or so, I'd want one. Perfect. And a couple of questions here in the chat. So uh, Dr. Thompson mentions that there's the ability to actually hardwire a surge protector inside your airstream. So you don't have to actually have to have it out by the pole. Oh. I, 
when this reminded me that that's actually what I did with mine. It's you know buried behind the electrical panel somewhere. So just oh, a, another another option for the uh, to to get that same protection. And then Dr. Thompson also wants to know. This is going back to kind of tools and and ways to make your life easier. Do you have an electric drill that you use for the stabilizer jacks to come up and down with a socket on actually, it, or do you I, use the manual? I manually do it. I, I like the act of manually doing it. I just like. I'm just so weird. It makes me feel like I'm accomplishing something and doing hard work. I love it. <laughs> fixing, a, I love it. fixing a military vehicle, you know, just. <laughs> <laughs> Movement but, is medicine. Movement I'm is weird. medicine. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, safety, uh, you know, either it's traveling solo or even just best practices as, as people go out in nature and, you know, far away from uh, services. Yeah, of course. And so, you know, in regards to safety and traveling, so there's been concerns expressed to me by my family, family and friends, uh, like I said, but like, I always follow my gut instinct, especially when something does not feel right. I, I really listen to that voice. You have to, uh, especially when you're alone. Um, so I do share my location with close friends and family. So they know where about I am and touch and I'll touch base with one of them saying, hey, like I'm traveling to this place. This is my destination. Uh, so they can kind of keep tabs um, just without me even having to tell them. Um, but I do have a spot device um, which uses satellite and can really be used anywhere in the world. And it allows me to call or text people um, or even um, use the emergency services if I'm um, without cell reception in an area. And another one I really uh, choose to use is uh, just good campgrounds. Like I'll just make sure even when I Google, they'll have Google reviews or go to links to, you know, those different sites that um, talk and talk and review those campgrounds uh, just to limit the sketchy parking lots or not well lit areas um, just for traveling with my, for my safety. Um, I do feel a lot more comfortable at those times when I'm with friends um, that I've done a couple parking lots days, um, but I typically stay at a campground when it's just me. The, the theme that's come up in every one of these Ask an Airstreamers that we've done yeah. about this topic is tr trust your instincts. And, and that, <laughs> that every one of these that, 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 that really? theme yeah. reemerges. But it makes sense, right? It makes perfect it sense. I mean, you got to, you got to. Um, <laughs> nothing like your whole life on like with you. And so <laughs> you yeah. don't feel good about it. Just it moves. <laughs> so I, I want to walk through a little bit of the, the key differences between a, a Bambi and a Caribou because on the outside, they could look seemingly similar, but there are yeah. some key distinctions that I, I want to walk through here. So uh, first and foremost, the Caribou is a, a bit more premium, kind of one step up from the Bambi. So it's going to weigh a bit more because there are more, more things in there to enhance the experience. So that's where you start to see the key difference between the unit base weight and this really factors into tow vehicle compatibility. So an important thing to, to look at as you're going down this journey of considering which one's best for you. The Caravel has standard stone guards. So these are the things that are replaceable in front of the Airstream, have little hinges on the side so you can get behind there and clean them. But if you think about driving, uh, not uncommon for, for small rocks to kick up behind the tow vehicle and those stone guards help help with that. You can add them to the Bambi afterwards. Uh, another key distinction, and, and you can give us a, a testament to how effective this is, but the Airstream is, or the AC is ducted in the Caravel. So there's little, little ducts versus having the actual AC unit pop through the center of the ceiling. So there we go, perfect. So two key benefits from my point of view, and maybe you can add to this, Marissa. One is yeah. it's just it's just quieter, which is which is nicer. And then the second one is it does a better do job of distributing the hot or cold air, whichever mode you happen to be in. Are those the, the two primary benefits for you, or would you add anything to that? Oh yeah, like I can comment. Mm -hmm. This trailer has gotten really hot when my windows are closed. I'm at work and I come home. Within three to five minutes, it's cool. Like awesome. I could turn it off. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Perfect. And then. Uh, continuing down this comparison, so some of the other distinctions on the awning side of things, the Caravel has a curbside awning and then optional rear and uh, and kind of side awnings. Uh, yep. So key distinction there versus the Bambi has just the single curbside awning. And then you get into some, you know, two other distinctions that we want to highlight. Cooktop three burner on the Caravel, two burner on the Bambi, and then the hitch 
jack in the front. This is what raises the nose up and down when you're hitching and unhitching, is powered in the caravel and then manual in the baby. Maybe you should get that one though, since you enjoy the, the physical work of, of raising it up and, <laughs> and then down. It's funny because like, I don't want to do with that. That one just, I think there's too much weight with that. That actually means something. <laughs> With. And I'm reminded, actually, you can do it manually if it was ever not to work. There yeah. is a, a, a manual crank that you could put on the top of that. <clears throat> so a lot of a lot of people who have joined us today, like I said earlier, are either waiting for theirs, have just uh, started their Caravel journey, or maybe in a similar Airstream product, uh, or just beginning you know, or continuing their exploration on what's right for them. So what's some advice that you would you would share with folks who are with us today? Yeah, of course. So I the advice I'd love to share with you all today is to really connect with your why, uh, because, you know, the how to is easy and it's not as intimidating as it may seem. Uh, yes, you know, things can go wrong, but the reward of new experiences triumphs any problem and they really don't seem as big when you're following your why. Um, so that's that's really my biggest advice. Another piece is for any um, woman who's on this call today and interested in, in travel or even solo travel to sign up for the newsletter that I've um, signed up for and love getting in my email is it's called Her Way and the Highway. Um, and I believe, you know, the more personal stories you read, uh, the more you manifest that thought and know you can do it too, because you can. Um, and another piece of advice um, that I did immediately when buying an Airstream was join the Facebook pages, I like Airstream Addicts, and I have the Airstream 22, 22 all things sport, Bambi and Caravel, um, because sometimes I'm, I'm one of a person that just like wants the answer right away. And yeah, I'll read the manual, but sometimes like I need that backup as well. And so within minutes, you have like dozens of people providing that guidance and their support um, when you're in a problem. Um, and then I know it can be hard to ask, uh, but you know, ask for help and get comfortable with it uh, because campers and local neighbors are the most friendly people on the planet and probably have gone through a similar struggle at some point. And not only can they help teach you, but they'll learn from you as well. There's always new things that people don't realize um, when, when, when talking and going through uh, issues when it comes to something so small or even big. And then really uh, to use this time, um, if you're, especially if you're solo, but it doesn't even matter, um, to learn more about yourself and what hobbies really drive your curiosity. Cause I, I find my creativity to be like 110% greater when I'm in the space of my Airstream. Uh, I feel like I journal, read, uh, and uh, like so much more extensively now than I ever have. And I've learned I play the ukulele, um, which has been so hard for me to find time to just sit down and do it. Um, but now that I'm connected to air, like to the airstream and in nature, like I, I feel like I allow space for that. Um, so um, really just kind of find things that you really want to grow as well personally when you're doing this uh, journey, because it, it really supports that. Um, and that's what I'd like to share today, Chris. Great advice. Uh, I'm going to do a, a follow up on this. What are some things, you know, two, two quick things maybe that you wish you knew before you bought it or while you're waiting to take delivery and drive it off the lot? What are some things that folks should consider who are in that same situation right now? Yeah, oh goodness. I, I wish that I, <laughs> um, I understood like, like know what, like I guess, how to explain it, because you want to have a tow vehicle and you want to have a certain size Airstream and making sure they match um, because if you go to, I, so I just thought like, oh, I can go and buy a truck and it's gonna tow anything and that's not the case. So uh, really, if you're doing that purchase at the same time to engage with a car dealership, engage with the Airstream dealership and come to a middle ground where you want to you know, go with that. Um, but if you already have a tow vehicle, then you just know, okay, this is my limits. And then I go to Airstream and, and uh, pick a, a Airstream based off that limit. Um, so I, I would say that that was one. And then another one, I just forgot it, um, was- I have notes I can give you a hint. It's the PO box piece. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so the PO box, um, I, I was doing where I just like mail things to random people um, and just pick them up. But I really recommend getting a PO box if you are a local um, in the area. Um, so I know that there are people who are always on the road to that travel have a different approach. Uh, but since I am um, at a place for a little bit longer, I do like a yearly a subscription at a, a UPS store. Um, and that's how I, I get my mail. Um, and I I wish I did that sooner because I, I realized this during the pandemic um, and I just didn't 
that they weren't open. I just didn't want to deal with that. So I ended up just mailing things to people and it was kind of annoying. <laughs> so <laughs> good, yeah. good, good perspective uh, on that. We'll drop a link to the a tow vehicle, how to find the right tow vehicle and all of the different weights and what they mean in the chat for, for folks who might be in the similar spot. So this is the first time we've done this. We'll see how it works. We've yeah. All throughout today's session, we've been asking folks through polls these questions. So I'll give you the results and then I'd love for you to tell me what you do and why. So the first question was manual awning or automatic? Almost, almost an even split here. So 55% really? yes. manual, 45% automatic. What do you do and why? I mean, I I'm, I'm, I'm between as well, but I do prefer manual just because of the simplicity and the working with my hands. I feel so accomplished doing it. I, there was a video earlier of me doing it. I just, I, I, I just feel good doing it. So. All right. Love it. Boon, next one is boondocking versus hookups. 35% boondock and then 65% do hookups. You've talked a little bit about your, how you use your Airstream, but what's yours and why? Oh yeah, I would say hookups because I have a lot of hair and I I use a lot of water, so <laughs> I, I <need> those hookups. <laughs> All right, this next one is beach camping versus mountain camping. Twenty nine percent beach, seventy one percent mountain. What are you? Yeah, so I love the feeling of being in the trees and feeling like I'm in the wild. So I have to I have to say um, uh, mountain camping, one hundred percent. I do love the sound of the waves at night being on the ocean, but I don't like sand. <laughs> so if you can find a mountain beach, that would be the best, best yeah, alternative, exactly. best combination. This next one is Airstream bathroom versus campground facilities. We have 85% love using their Airstream bathroom and then 15% campground facilities. What are you? Oh, that's that's awesome. That's a lot better. We I remember reading this on like in the Airstream community and it was like a hot topic of conversation and felt very 50-50. Um, I'm 100% use my Airstream bathroom. Uh, like why I it literally takes up one third of my trailer. So I feel like I should use it. I'd be wasting a lot of space <laughs> and the convenience and personal space is very nice, especially uh, through a pandemic. It makes perfect sense. And then yeah. last one before we hop into some more Q&A is hand wash laundry versus laundromat. We have 35% hand wash and 65% laundromat. Okay, I'm I'm gonna go with the hand. I love hand washing it. I just feel like I'm 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 more mindful of the clothes I wore and actually physically cleaning them. Um, and plus, you have that clo and something people didn't may not know, and I didn't know until I bought this is you have a clothesline in the shower that's built in, so you can actually hang things mm -hmm. uh, in the shower, um, and that was a game changer for me uh, as well. So, gotta go with the hand wash for now. Perfect. I'll have to get some tips from you on how to do that because I have no idea how to do that. <clears throat> but it makes perfect sense from a convenience standpoint. Let's hop over to some couple of minutes of questions before we wrap up. So Pam wants to know, uh, have you added any shelving to the closet of your caravel or is it as is from the factory? It is as is. I have not changed that at all. Um, and it works, so. works well for you? Yeah, because I, I hang my clothes um, where it's mm -hmm. a hang rack and up top. I actually, that's like more of just like odd end things. Um, so, and then I, the back here is where all my clothes are as well and under the bed. Non-seasonal below, seasonal up. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Joe wants to know, what do you do to protect your Airstream when you're out at work and it's unattended for you know hours on end? Do you have a hitch lock or some sort of anti-theft device? Yep, I have a hitch lock um, and I feel so much better with having that hitch lock. Uh, I, I used to not and I was parking on base though, so I felt more comfortable, but yeah, I, I hitched that thing up for sure and no issues. Perfect. A uh, quick question here in terms of where you got your small outdoor table. You remember the, the yeah. brand and where you found it? Yeah, I get REI. I got that. It was like 30 bucks. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And then have you have you spent time camping in true winter conditions with snow on the ground? And and what's that been like? Yeah, I so I have had some snow on the dirt ground. I wouldn't say it was like crazy. Um, I did end up putting it in storage just because of the nature of my job. I, I couldn't fathom if anything went went wrong uh, there's been just a lot going on with work um so i did store it for a couple months um so we'll, we'll see i don't know i don't know what this year is going to bring either it's been really busy so <laughs> maybe there... um but <laughs> i haven't had any issues with the antifreeze hose um uh and um just the furnace it's been it gets super warm in here honestly i just like it's it gets hot so i i don't even i actually oh this is what i want to say i use a space heater i don't even have the time needed to even use the furnace because the space heater heats this thing up like an oven uh, so you don't even have to use propane. Like literally I've been in 30 degree temperatures, even twenties and use a space heater and was fine. 
It, one benefit uh, on this using the furnace is they, when Airstream builds them, they actually duct some of the output of that furnace to the tanks underneath. Oh, so it helps also keep those good. warm. Okay. If, if you don't have a tank heater, some models have tank heater. So um, depending, we also did an Ask an Airstreamer on winter camping. Uh, we had oh. one, one member of the community who actually camped up in Canada with you know, mountains of snow around. So the folks are interested in that. Uh, encourage you to check that out. And then one more question here. Yeah. Um, just in terms of, of COVID and maybe how it's impacted your, your travels to date, is it, you feel like it's unaffected because you have your little cocoon driving around or, or what's that been like? Yeah, it, I have been. And it's funny because with the military, they're like, oh, you have a trailer and that's what you're in. Great. Like, go, go live your life. <laughs> it's, it's been a positive thing for me um, being able to travel. Uh, without needing to fly all the time. Um, so I, I would say it really hasn't been as impacted as a lot of other friends and family who just choose not to travel because they don't want to stay in like hotels or Airbnbs and stuff. I don't have that issue. So people actually like would want to just come with me. <laughs> so, um, and I don't have to worry about weather. So it's like, it doesn't matter if it's raining or not. Like you can just play the trip and can go. I love it. Freedom. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we'll leave it there for today. We, we put a promo code on the screen here for Airstream Supply Company. Okay. And yeah. Marissa, I can't thank you enough for, for sharing your story and your enthusiasm and your, your perspective. I'm sure it will leave a mark on the folks who joined us today on yeah. Ask an Airstreamer. So thank you very much. Yeah. And for everyone who joined us, please keep an eye out for the two question survey that will come out here shortly. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Awesome, yeah. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can answer them as well. Um, What's can the best I, way to, for people to get a hold of you? Um, I would say probably like just if, either email. Well, actually, I'd say not email, like Instagram probably. Um, but um, I don't know how you want me to share that or if that's allowed. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to share your handle here, that's great. And then if okay. folks want to email anything that comes in at hello at airstream.com, we'll make sure that gets over to you. So if you want to share your Instagram handle right now, please, please do. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And did you just drop that in the chat? I Is think I did? did. Yeah. I just, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Very, very wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> Great. All right. Have okay. a good one. See you next yeah. time. Thank you, Chris. See you later. Bye. Bye.